Hello, and thank you for joining this webinar today. My name is Stacey Bender, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Counseling and School Psychology at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. This webinar, Module 2, Prerequisites to Social Emotional Behavior Screening, or SEB screening, will be describing the important action steps that um, you or teams involved in the screening process in your schools should consider before the actual administration of screening. Before moving ahead, I want to highlight this module's supporting authors, Dr. Brian Daniels from the University of Massachusetts, Boston, soon to be Dr. Whitney Walker from UMass Boston. And I'd also like to mention that this module is supported by the Birch Project, whose leadership consists of Dr. Melissa Perot from UMass Boston and Dr. Sarah Wickholm from UMass Amherst. A little bit more about the Birch Project that's supporting this module. The mission of the Birch Project is to provide professional development and resources for schools and strengthen the coordination of behavioral health supports provided by school and community agencies. It is housed within UMass Boston and UMass Amherst. Additionally, its partnership includes Boston Children's Hospital Neighborhood Partnership Program and many local school districts, including Boston Public Schools. Additional information about the Birch Project can be found at www.umb.edu backslash birch. Here's the overview of the webinar today. We will talk about assembling a school mental health team, stakeholder buy-in and feedback, identifying screening objectives, using data before and during screening, identifying how data will be used, consent and assent procedures, and data sharing. The first step is to create a school mental health team. According to the National Center for School Mental Health, a school mental health team is defined as a team of school and community stakeholders at a school or district level that meets regularly, uses data-based decision-making, and relies on action planning to support student mental health. The, the purpose of the team is to be this consistent go-to group who helps to shape district guidelines and standards for school mental health, including SCB screening, since SCB screening is part of supporting school mental health for all students. The team communicates and coordinates amongst one another, as well as acts as a liaison between team members and others. The team plans for and provides training, coaching, and implementation support. This is an important purpose of the team and really should be considered an ongoing task. Throughout the screening process, there will be a need for ongoing training and coaching. Um, as the needs and the processes of training, of screening, progress, training needs will differ and should be supported um, by the team. Lack of training can be a major reason for resistance. Although it may seem that training or coaching happens only at the beginning of prepping for implementation, the team should plan for ongoing support and engaging in problem solving. The team implements mental health practices and works together to maximize resources to address the needs of students. I wanna to mention too that you wanna be cautious that there are not multiple teams within your school or district working on the same effort. This school mental health team that I'm referring to can be the same as your MTSS team or your PBIS team. It does not need to be an additional team. If it is the same as the MTSS or PBIS team, there are certain considerations and tasks specific to screening that I'll be going through in these next few slides. An important aspect of the school mental health team or MTSS or PBIS team is that there are diverse members, stakeholders, and voices on the team. Recommended members of the team can include administrators such as principals, vice principals, special education coordinators, school mental health providers such as the school psychologist, social workers, counselors, teachers, both general education and special education, students, if it's developmentally appropriate, Families and recruiting families through places like school newsletters or asking for input at school events can be helpful. I've also seen that the president or member of PTAs serving on school teams um, have been used to represent a family voice. This can be a good strategy, but I'd like to mention that not all families have resources that allow them to engage with PTAs and therefore efforts by the school should be made to ensure diverse family representation. Other team members can include individuals from the community, such as community mental health providers, such as those from mental health organizations in the local area, 
and community members that have a relationship with the school. Allowing for community members to be on the team can be a great opportunity for the school to build relationships with those community resources. When considering the composition or who will make up the school mental health team, be thinking about what role each person will serve, who will lead, who will be the point person for teachers or families when they have questions, who will help manage the data. Considering how each member contribute and what expertise each member brings to the group can be useful as well, such as who has leadership experience, who has an effective collaboration style? Who has experience in or interest in data analysis? Are there, are there folks on the team who have previous experience with screening? Also consider what level of availability does, each, uh, does the team expect of each member? This could ultimately influence who is on the team. Give consideration also for how teams might meet. Given that it's very common these days for communication and meetings to happen virtually or remotely, Consider this as a modality um, and whether the team would be on board with this being the way to meet to increase availability or efficiency. Once you have a team created, team meetings must be scheduled. It's important to schedule team meetings that occur regularly and to conduct meetings in a clear manner. What is often useful to accomplish this is the use of a meeting agenda, and this way members of the team know what topics will be discussed and all team members can plan to attend the meeting um, prepared accordingly. In meetings, it's helpful to focus on action items or what can be done. It's helpful to assign a member or members to complete that action item and as well as to include it on the next meeting's agenda so that the team can follow up on those items. It helps team members know what their next steps are and helps to keep one another accountable. There are several great resources to help plan meetings and clarify roles of team members. I have examples listed here, as you can see in the bullet points, um, and then I'll also briefly share some snapshots of them on my upcoming slides. These resources I just want to mention are from the School Health Assessment and Performance Evaluation, or SHAPE system, which is a public access web-based platform that offers schools and districts resources to improve school mental health quality, SHAPE was developed by the National Center for School Mental Health and the field, and the resources on the next three slides that I'm sharing um, here were created by the National Center for School Mental Health and the University of Maryland School of Medicine. So this document allows you to see the various roles and functions and, and work to identify who serves in that role and function. A few slides earlier, I mentioned that you don't want to have multiple teams working on the same effort. So this is a helpful worksheet to figure out who is doing what, what gaps there might be, and who will fill them. There are additional tables to this worksheet. I'm just showing you page one of this worksheet. Um, so there are additional roles that are listed on pages two and three. But I like this because if you take a look um, and see the task of monitor student performance or intervenes and consults as needed, what school personnel are responsible or historically have been part of meeting these different roles within the school. This next tool that I have listed is the School Mental Health Team Alignment Tool. It's another worksheet to help schools identify all the teams in their building that address factors related to school mental health well-being, school culture, and climate. It's a nice visual to see the membership of the team, so who, who's on this team, what tier are they addressing as part of this team, what purpose they serve, and their meeting frequency. It also helps to identify what activities are missing and what's being addressed. This could also be a way, as I mentioned earlier, um, your school mental health team that I'm referring to in this presentation um, could be the PDIS or MTSS team. So by completing this worksheet, you can maybe see, are there teams that already exist that are doing a large number of tasks that are related to what we hope the screening team or the school mental health team will do. And then here's a, meeting, a school mental health team meeting agenda template. Um, it includes best practices for team meetings. I like this because you can edit to make it relevant for your team and your team meetings. So there are spaces to include information about the meeting, such as the meeting name and the location. It includes a list of agenda items. And of course, again, you would add your own agenda, agenda items for each meeting. And I like this box at the bottom 
that includes these action steps. Um, it reminds us of when we're leaving this meeting, there should be a next step. It also helps to identify who's responsible, who are we checking back with, who is the point person on this action step, and by when should we be checking in or should we um, have that action step completed. It's extremely useful to have different team members have a role during meetings. For example, who's the facilitator of the meeting, who's starting the meeting, who's making sure that the agenda items are being covered. Are we making sure that we're not spending too much time on each agenda item? And speaking of time, who's keeping track of time? Are we starting on time? Are we ending our meetings on time? Who is taking meeting notes and sharing them with the group afterwards? And who's creating the agenda and sending it out before the next meeting? The more clarity that each person has with their role, the increased likelihood that meetings will run smoothly and effectively. So far, we've talked about creating a team and setting up team meetings as one prerequisite to screening. Another prerequisite is to enhance stakeholder buy-in and consider how feedback will be handled throughout the screening process. It's important to share the, um, the importance of addressing students' social emotional behavioral health in schools providing opportunities for dialogue about this importance and opportunity for questions, problem solving and training can also help to improve that stakeholder buy-in. This helps stakeholders know that this isn't just a one time, they're asking my perspective at the beginning of this process, but rather this is a feedback loop and I'll have the opportunity to share how I think things are going, the team will make adjustments as necessary. Planning ahead and creating a mechanism for continuous feedback helps stakeholders know that they'll be communicated with throughout the process. And this is helpful for the team too, because if something isn't going well, it can be addressed earlier rather than later. Some examples of ways to collect feedback are to conduct focus groups with students or teachers so they can share their experience and input on how things are going. Meetings with families and meetings with teachers can be set up to gather information. Or if there are already existing meetings that are held regularly throughout the school year, such as family night or monthly staff meetings, time could be set aside during those already scheduled meetings for the purpose of getting feedback. So instead of creating another meeting for, for people to attend and something else to add to people's plates, are there ways that we can carve out some time during pre-existing times that people would be together anyway? Feedback can also be collected from surveys. A nice option with surveys is that they can be completed anonymously. Identifying objectives is the next prerequisite to screening. I wanna emphasize the importance of identifying objectives and goals prior to engaging in screening. By conducting screening, what does the team, the school, the district hope to accomplish? It's assumed that the hope is to monitor student social emotional behavioral functioning over time and efficiently link resources to their needs and that's absolutely the case I, but i've also worked with schools where this is the goal but there are additional objectives that they were hoping to meet such as um, a school who wanted to use screen, screening data uh, to understand and to reduce the disproportionality of marginalized students receiving harsh harsh or exclusionary punishment I work with schools who wanted to use screening data to support school-wide PBIS in the upper grades in middle school and high school because it was being used and implemented at the elementary school, but not so much at those upper level grades. And so they wanted to screen so they could say, hey, we, we need this support. We need this, these systems in place for middle school and high schoolers. And I've also worked with, us, with schools who um, wanted to not only reduce behavior challenges in schools, but they also wanted to use screening to identify what social emotional behavioral strengths students are coming to school with and use this data to help build on those strengths within the school. Knowing your objectives can help you improve clarity in the purpose of screening and help you at various decision points in the process. For example, selecting what screener to use. Be sure to include all team and stakeholder voices in, in identifying objectives. This helps with buy-in but also allows for a diverse understanding of concerns and goals. You may end up prioritizing particular objectives, but reflect on whose objectives are prioritized, whose voice is heard, whose voice is not. Be sure to incorporate perspectives of all and especially those from historically marginalized groups. The context and culture of students, schools, and communities they are situated within must be taken into account 
if the objectives identified are not culturally relevant, if they seem far removed from the context of the community, or they don't consider the larger forces that contribute to current functioning of students, schools, teachers, families, stakeholders may not be interested or may not be as invested. I'd like to highlight that objectives can change, and that's part of the process. At the beginning of this process, the objectives may vary, um, but they become more refined as the process um, goes on, as data is examined, and adjustments are made. Data from screening is not the only data being used throughout this process. So I'm talking a lot about data and I'm talking about when we collect the screening data, but data can be used even before screening is implemented, which is what I'd like to emphasize here. It can be used to support and even justify SEB screening. Consider what data are already being collected in schools to suggest that SEB screening and multi-tiered systems of supports are needed. For example, is there a large number of discipline referrals? Lowered attendance, lower than usual grades or test scores, student reports of bullying. These are just some examples of data that might be used to tell you that screening is needed. In the next slide, there are some additional data examples that I'll get to in just a moment. Be sure to use data to examine how students are currently being identified for supports. If a multi-tiered system of support is, is not being used, what students receive supports? Is it only students that are eligible for special education? If a multi-tiered system of supports is implemented, who receives tier two and tier three services? How is that determined? What are the implications if the current delivery practices are maintained? What are the implications if they're changed? By examining this, it will help the team understand what the current process is in your school and considerations for how it could potentially change when screening is implemented. Be sure to consider and select contextually and culturally relevant social emotional behavioral screening tools, procedures, processes, and supports. Here's the table I referred to on the last slide. These are examples of school data related to school mental health from the National Center for School Mental Health. I like this because it provides other ideas of where and how to collect data to support SEB screening. These are also options of the type of data schools could collect in conjunction with SEB screening data to see if there are changes in these areas after supports are implemented. After identifying objectives and possibly using screening data to support the use of SEB screening, there are additional considerations regarding data. It's important to ask the questions, what type of data does the team want to collect and what will be the process for collecting it? So first, what data will tell us if we've met our objectives? How will we know if we've accomplished what we've said to accomplish? Second, how will we collect the data? Create a plan for administration and collection. How many times a year? If you're conducting universal screening for all students, it would be two or three benchmarks a year. Schedule this ahead of time. Also, who will be completing the screening? Teachers, families, or students? Typically, or most commonly, teachers are the informants for screeners, um, but there are forms where families can fill out to provide their input into their child's functioning. And certainly there are various self-report screeners where students can be the person filling out um, that social emotional behavioral screening. How will data be entered and who will enter it? Whatever way the data will be entered, be sure that the team has access to the system and training and use of the system. For example, some screeners when purchased come with cloud-based storage and training for those who are in charge of that data management system. How will data be analyzed? Be sure to schedule this ahead of time. Is this feasible? The way in which we're thinking about the type and how we're collecting the data feasible and is it socially valid? How and who will data be shared with? We'll talk a little bit more about this at the end of the webinar, but as you're listening right now, who do you think would be, it would be helpful with to share the data with? And lastly, how will we seek feedback from stakeholders? Thinking back a few slides to the way stakeholders could provide input on objectives, you could use those ways to also gather feedback, such as the focus groups, meetings, and anonymous surveys. Planning for data collection. Um, it's important for data collection tasks to be assigned to team members for clarity, consistency, and accountability. There are lots of tasks. Just based on the various questions that I had asked on the previous slide, there's a lot to consider. And if you think back to your team composition, who would be the most appropriate or willing to take on these various roles? 
When examining and sharing data, continuously monitor if particular groups of students are disproportionately identified as at risk, what types of services are they referred for, and what types of services do they receive. As mentioned earlier, data should be collected throughout the SEB screening process. Identifying how the data will be used or linked to intervention and supports can help improve the likelihood of this occurring once screening has started. Oops. Okay, there we go. How are, um, sometimes it can be the case where screening is implemented, data is being collected, but then that's where screening stops. We want to screen so that we have data to link to appropriate supports. Here are questions for the team to consider early in the screening process. What interventions and supports are already available in the school or the district? What data will be used in determining supports? Will it only be screening data alone or combined with other data? Will we look at screening data at individual student level and linking to supports or classroom wide levels and linking to supports? Or are we doing a combination of both? What interventions and su support should be implemented at the various tiers? It may be helpful as you're thinking about these questions and um, maybe not knowing the answer to some of these questions, it could be helpful for you and your team to create a protocol of decision rules and possibly resource map of school and community resources. There's really great resources available for resource mapping um, that others have created and you can use and customize for your own school. I'm, I'm going to refer you again back to that SHAPE system from the National Center for School Mental Health as they have so many great workbooks, templates, and guides available to efficiently and effectively resource map for your school. In terms of consent and assent and screening, there's some considerations that should be pointed out. According to the Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act, IDEA, if screening is used to determine instruction or is conducted as part of regular school activities, it does not require parent or caregiver consent. If screening is individualized, such as you're screening only one student due to concerns, consent is required. The majority of screening procedures are considered a process used to inform regular school activities, including social emotional behavior screening, but there are caveats. Um, for example, if students are completing self-report for screening, rather than teachers or parents completing the screening, the Protection of Pupil Rights Amendment says that the school cannot require all students to participate and the school may want to consider obtaining parent or caregiver or guardian consent. If screening questions include um, items related to mental or psychological problems, you may want to give parents, caregivers, guardians the opportunity to be informed and opt out. Each team or school needs to determine the purpose and process of screening, who are the informants, what is being asked on the screening tool, how will the data be used in order to know which way to proceed in terms of consent. So it's not a one size fits all. It's really important to be thinking about all of these things um, to know which way to proceed in terms of consent. Please reference IDEA, PPRA, ESA and FERPA for more information and details about this. In terms of consent, I just referenced or just mentioned the term opt out. So I want to just mention two um, types of consent. One is active consent where a parent or caregiver provide a written signature to allow their, their child to be screened. And then there's a passive opt out consent where the parent or caregiver are informed of the process and are asked to provide a signature only if they do not want their child screened. So in other words, not responding serves as consent. Carefully consider which consent process is legally and ethically appropriate for your screening process. Student assent is not legally required, but it's ethical and best practice to provide students information about screening and provide them an opportunity to agree or not agree to participate. To improve understanding and likelihood of parent caregiver consent and assent, discuss the importance of social emotional behavioral health and how it links to supports in schools prior to obtaining consent, prior to even talking about um, screening. 
this understanding and seeing how it fits into the culture of school, how it supports the well being of students, it may enhance buy in from families and students. The more we talk about it, the more it's, it's part of school culture, the more normative it will become. Information about social emotional behavioral health and screening can be shared by sending home flyers and emails, including information on school websites or remote learning platforms, during school events and meetings, and through various signs around the school. The last prerequisite to screening I'll talk about is data sharing procedures. Prior to screening, you want to determine who data will be shared with and when. Sharing data with stakeholders is a way to obtain continuous feedback, share accountability and transparency. It also helps with collaboration. Data should be shared with the team and can often be shared, of course, in meetings such as grade level meetings, MTSS meetings or PBIS meetings, if those are separate from the mental health team meetings. Some schools share aggregated data in teacher professional development presentations and school newsletters so that families are also aware of school efforts in this area. There are ethical and legal guidelines to consider when sharing data. In the instance of data sharing, FERPA and HIPAA may apply here. FERPA applies to school employed staff, HIPAA applies to hospitals, outpatient mental health, and school based community providers. Be sure to have procedures to protect confidentiality and privacy of your students and families and teachers and obtain any releases of information across system partners before screening begins. And if this applies to your school in terms of data sharing outside of the school, parents and caregivers should be informed of this. Thank you so much for watching this webinar today. As a recap, the information we talked about includes assembling a school mental health team, stakeholder buy-in and feedback, identifying screening objectives, using data before and during screening, identifying how data will be used, consent and assent procedures, and data sharing. Here are the references listed from the presentation. And if you have any further questions about this presentation or SEB screening in general, please feel free to contact me or the Birch Project by using the contact information listed here. Thank you so much.